Okay, so we ended our on our last slide here with the formed elements of blood. Basically, the erythrocytes, um, like I mentioned, lose their nucleus uh, early on during, well, later on during their development, but before entering circulation. So if you take an erythrocyte and cut it in half, you'll see that the edges are thicker than the center, and this allows a, a better distribution of hemoglobin through the cell for the distribution of oxygen. We have about 260 re million red blood cells at any given time in a single drop of blood if you are not anemic. Okay, so what is this magical hemoglobin that we keep talking about? Hemoglobin is a molecule that contains um, a ferrous uh, group in it. So hemoglobin, Hb, contains four of these uh, ferrous units. The ferrous are uh, linked to nitrogen and carbons, uh, carbon rings, which give rise to what we call a heme group. So each individual hemoglobin molecule has four chains, four protein chains, two alpha chains. So here's alpha chain one, alpha chain two, and then two beta chains, beta one and beta two. All four chains, however, have the same heme group in the center. Alpha and beta have slightly different conformations. You don't need to worry about that. Oh, one more thing. So what this does is it allows a single hemoglobin molecule to carry up to four oxygen molecules. So there's an O2 here, O2 here, and O2 here, and O2 here. So we call that uh, oxygen carrying capacity for hemoglobin, and you'll talk about that more in physiology. Now let's move on to leukocytes or white blood cells. White blood cells, they do have nuclei and what they're really important for, FXN means function in immunity. So we talked about the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. So basically the granulocytes are can also be called granular lymphocytes. These are also made in the red bone marrow and they have granules, which you'll see pretty soon here, when you look at them uh, after they've been stained under the microscope. There are three types of granulocytes, the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, okay, N-E-B. The agranulocytes, or the, the cells that don't look like they have granules in them, um, just basically look like a, they look pink, frankly, after you stain them, and those are the monocytes, and lymphocytes, okay? And so even though we say um, lymphocytes a lot, the real term for white blood cells, like the general term, is going to be leukocytes, okay? So the leukocytes are the same thing as white blood cells. Lymphocytes are a type of leukocyte. So when people are looking at the types of um, white blood cells are around or maybe looking to see if somebody is sick, what they're going to do is a differential white blood cell count. Um, the differential white blood cell count tells you how many white blood cells of each different type are in your blood at a given time. Now, I put this silly slide in here for you so that you can remember the names of all the different types of leukocytes, okay, granular and agranular. And basically we have this silly little anagram, never let monkeys eat bananas. N for neutrophils, L for lymphocytes, M for monocytes, E for eosinophils, and B for basophils. Now which ones are the granulocytes? N, neutrophils, E, eosinophils, and basophils. So if you look at the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils here, you'll see these little purple granules in here. Over here in the eosinophils, they, the granules look more pink. Don't worry about why that happens. It's a quality of the staining. But the agranulocytes, the lymphocytes and the monocytes, you'll see that they have much larger kind of lobular, well, in this case it's kind of like just blob, like uh, nuclei. Platelets and erythrocytes don't count in this particular group, right, even though they're in this picture. So here are your leukocytes over here, and remember, Luke has all the white blood cells. So the granulocytes, here's a neutrophil. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, it's really hard to see on this basophil here. Let me move my little window down here. It's really hard to see on this basophil here, the, um, the nucleus. Basophils have kind of, again, lobular um, barbell-shaped nuclei. It's just really hard to see in this particular, um, let me change my pointer color. 
Uh, it's kind of hard to see in this particular uh, photograph. I think this might be the nucleus over here. Maybe it went up here. But you'll see that the, the nuclei are kind of blob, blobby, lobular. And you can see all the different granules here in purple. The eosinophils, like I said, the granules stain in uh, red for a specific reason that you don't need to know right now. And then the basophils have the purple granules. So neutrophils, like I mentioned before, uh, can make up most of your white blood cells. The neutrophils um, are phagocytic. They can go around and munch things up, okay? They do have two or more lobes, and they have those granules. The eosinophils, very relatively few of those, 2 to 4%, they're also phagocytic, so they go around eating things up again. Now, the granules, again, are red, and it's they're red because they're stained with a dye actually called eosin. Okay, and that's why they're called eosinophils. You're going to see a lot of eosinophil, eosinophils developing in uh, allergic reactions. Eosinophilic asthma um, is common in children and adults. And eosinophilic uh, asthma, uh, the eosinophils are releasing compounds that uh, actually can cause an asthmatic reaction. They have two kind of lobes to the nuclei, so they're kind of weird shaped again. And, you know, like I said, they you'll find lots of eosinophils during your allergic reactions, but you'll also find a lot of eosinophils when somebody has parasites or worms. You'll find a lot of eosinophils in dogs and cats when they uh, have a, a worm infection. And then our basophils here, uh, very few of those, 0.5 to 1%. These guys release histamine. And so this is a part of what gives you swelling when you have an allergic reaction or tissue damage. Um, they are involved in the inflammatory response. Inflammation is partly in response to what? Histamine, okay? So that's what's giving you that swelling. And the granules are purpley blue. Now the agranulocytes are going to be your monocytes and lymphocytes, okay? So the monocytes, not very many of those, also phagocytic. They have kind of this weird kidney bean-shaped nucleus. Let's out, try to outline it here. Man, I hope someday I get better with this pointer. This is really kind of crazy. Maybe kind of a heart-shaped. Um, and these guys kind of wander around under your tissues uh, after they leave the bloodstream. These guys can squeeze out of capillary beds and get into uh, uh, like the um, uh, dermal layer of your skin. The lymphocytes, got, we've got a lot of those floating around. Uh, big, big purple nucleus on those guys. You'll always know a lymphocyte because the, basically the nucleus takes up most of the cytoplasm. And there are two types, are T lymphocytes or T cells. T cells come in two versions, killer T cells or um, helper T cells. You'll talk about those in a lot more detail in physiology and how they work. And then the B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes produce uh, our produce antibodies that float around in the plasma, which is why they call them plasma B cells. They're producing the antibodies that help protect you against pathogens. Um, B cells are also going to be involved in your immune memory. So once you, uh, a group of B cells starts making antibodies, there are some that get kicked off that will always remain, well not always, but maybe for a long period of time, remain in your uh, system that allows your body to remember, um, hey, I've been exposed to this pathogen before, and then it'll cause a very quick recovery and very quick immune response for your T cells. So a first infection, you get better in a couple of weeks, or at least I would say after the first exposure to something, you'll get better maybe in, you know, I don't know, eight to 12 days, 14 days. After second encounter with that same pathogen, you'll start getting better pretty quick in like five or six days. So thrombocytes, what are the thrombocytes? Thrombocytes are produced in the bone marrow. These are our platelets. They're made from a st set of stem cells called megakaryocytes. The megakaryocytes bleb off pieces of cytoplasm. Um, these platelets are gonna be just basically hunks of, of cytoplasm that or hunks of, of cellular membrane with cytoplasm, no nucleus, no organelles. They don't last very long. So our body is always kicking out lots and lots of platelets. Their main role is for blood clotting, uh, and they are the main component of forming a scab or a platelet plug. So a thrombocyte is its old name. Typically, we're going to be calling them platelets in class, though. 
So here's a final picture showing you what the hematopoietic uh, lineage is for specific cells. Hematoblasts are stem cells, okay? The stem cells that are going to be giving rise to either lymphoid or myeloid stem cells. The myeloid stem cells give rise to megakaryocytes, they give you platelets, or to red blood cells eventually. Now, the myoblasts also are going to be producing cells that become uh, basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils, or your granulocytes. And there's also a line for the monoblast, which are going to become monocytes. The lymphocytes have their own very special lineage over here, the lymphoid stem cells. So depending on the type of activity happening in the body, if you have a proliferation, an inappropriate proliferation of one type of blast cell or progenitor cell, all right, then you could end up with too many erythrocytes. Too many erythrocytes uh, is called polycytemia, polycytemia vera particularly. Uh, sometimes if there are too many uh, lymphoblasts. That'll give you too many lymphocytes and lymphoma. So depending on the type of uh, overproduction, you could end up with a different type of cancer. All right, that's it for uh, chapter 20. I will be seeing you soon uh, for chapter 21 on circulation.